guys welcome back i hope everyone's had a wonderful week girls i love you i miss you and i hope you're doing well now i'm sure there's many of you who clicked on this video because of the title and i'm sure there are those of you who may have found it to be somewhat offensive what do you even mean by that well if you have a pastor who stands in that pulpit and teaches or preaches out of the niv then your pastor is a devil and i'll prove it to you we're going to take and we're going to compare the King James with the NIV. And I'm going to show you the vast differences between the two. And by the time we get to the end, I think you'll be shocked at what you hear. See, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. And if God is not the author of it, then who is? Satan, right? But we have all these people running around saying stupid things like, my God is this, and my God is that, and my Bible says this, and my Bible says that. You know, all this stuff they're saying, uh, none of it's the same. It's all different. Why? Because we don't think the same. We don't believe the same. We don't see things the same. Why? Because of all the confusion that has been brought forth through these other perceived translations. This is exactly why God never intended for his word to be spread out in the manner in which it is today. Oh, really? Can you prove it? Yes, I can. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, King James says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So you see, God's not playing around here. He's serious. Well, why is it so important? Why does it matter what you read? Why would God get so upset over this? Okay, I'll show you. Listen, it works like this. The Bible is given to us by God. And it portrays a word image of Christ. The moment we add or take away from the Bible, we have changed the image of Christ and we have produced another God, an idol that cannot save. So, it leaves people unsaved who are instructing other people, meaning the pastors, and us, the Christians, the, the congregation, we also remain unsaved ourselves. Why? Because we're not hearing the truth of God's word. We're being lied to, being deceived, we're being led astray. Listen, have you ever heard of the term or the phrase, the promised seed? Okay, well, the promised seed is in reference to Christ. Uh, but it's that word seed I want you to focus on because it brings up a very important question, which is, who is the seed of Abraham? Is it the people who lived during or around the time that Abraham lived? Are they the seed of Abraham? You, me, our children, our grandchildren, are we the seed of Abraham? The church teaches that we are. But God says no. Listen, pay attention. When it comes to that word seed, uh, you'll notice that that word seed is singular, not plural. You can't take a singular word in a singular form and replace it with a, another word that is uh, presented in a plural form. It, it takes away everything from the scripture. It totally and completely changes the entire meaning of the scripture. Okay? Now, turn with me to uh, Galatians 3.16. King James says, Now to Abraham and his seed, singular, were the promises made. He says not and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. Okay? Now this singular word seed, it occurs many times in the Bible. And in Genesis alone, it occurs 57 times. Now, 
Is it not clear that God intended the word seed to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ and not to anyone else? Is it not clear that God wanted us to see the relationship between Galatians 3.16 and many other verses in Genesis? Well, let's have a look. We're going to take a look here at two verses. Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 21.12. So, Genesis 3.15, King James says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The NIV says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Okay? The first thing we notice is they change the word seed in King James to the word offspring in the NIV. Now, I know there's a lot of people that will say you can use that word offspring in a singular form. I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'm not going to try to explain it to you. But I will tell you that as we go through all these scriptures, you will begin to see and to realize they wasn't referring to this word offspring in a singular form. Okay? Just continue to listen. Number two, it says, He shall bruise thy head in King James. The NIV says, He will crush your head. Bruise and crush. Two totally different words, two totally and completely different meanings. King James also says, And thou shalt bruise his heel. The NIV says, And you will strike his heel. Bruise and heal. Once again, two totally different words, two totally and completely different meanings. When you change the words, you change the meaning. All right? Now, another thing you need to notice here. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Okay? Well, when you read that, you automatically think, Okay, this is God. He's having a conversation with Satan here in the garden. And when it says between thee and the woman, well, you do a head count, you've got God, you've got Satan, you've got Adam, and you've got Eve. Those four and no more. Out of the whole bunch, she's the only female, right? So, when God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, we automatically assume, we, we believe, and we think that he is referring to Eve, but he's not. See, just like us, the devil, he thought he was referring to Eve too. Which is why he caused Cain to rise up against his brother Abel and to slay him or kill him because his way of thinking was this. If I kill or I destroy the seed, then I get rid of the problem. I get rid of the threat and there's no way that he can rise up and uh, bruise my head. That's his, his whole line of thinking here. Okay? But he wasn't referring to Eve. He was prophesying and he's referring to Mary. Listen. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He, he, capital H, referring to the Lord, he shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay? Now, her seed. Who is her seed? Who's her child? Who's her firstborn? Jesus, right? So Jesus is her seed. Her is Mary. The seed is Jesus. He, Jesus, shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. When it says thy seed in reference to Satan, well, of course, you know, we say, well, Satan didn't have no kids. Well, listen, this is referring to the Antichrist. Okay? So, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, Mary, and between thy seed, the Antichrist, and her seed, Jesus Christ, and he, Jesus Christ, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see? When you have all these other perceived translations, they change and twist and turn and leave out so much, you'd never be able to see this. Okay? Genesis 21, 12. King James says, and God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the land, and because of thy bondwoman. 
This is in reference to Hagar and Ishmael. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, <clears throat> hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Okay? And I V says, But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Okay? In both verses, the word seed is left out. In Genesis 21, 12, seven words have been left out and ten words have been added. And yet the NIV does show the word seed in Galatians 3, 16. The authors of the NIV have deliberately changed the Old Testament prophecies in such a way that they cannot be connected with the Holy Spirit's announcement of the fulfillment of the promise and of the prophecies. Okay? Now, when you look at uh, Genesis 21, 12, in the NIV, it uses the word reckoned. But in King James, it says, uh, thy seed be called, okay? Called to be uh, brought forth, brought out of. Okay, you can't bring something out of something without it first being in something. Christ was in the bloodline before the foundation of the world. And this is what this is referring to, the bloodline. Okay, so he was in the bloodline, has always been in the bloodline. It is through the blood of Jesus. Jesus is the bloodline. Okay. But according to NIV, when it says, will be reckoned, that means uh, will be made known, uh, will uh, be made aware of, or uh, a part of, will be placed into. So it's saying that Christ is not in the bloodline, but will be placed in the bloodline. It's saying that Christ is not the bloodline, but Christ will be put into the bloodline. Two totally, totally, completely different words. Two totally, totally, completely different meanings here. Okay? It changes the entirety of the scripture altogether. Alright? Now, these guys who publish and produce the NIV and the translators of it, you know, these are educated men. They, they've been to college. they got degrees. You know, they're considered to be so smart. Alright? Listen. Were not these learned men aware of the words in Galatians 3.16, Genesis 3.15, and Genesis 21.12, and that the basic meaning in all three places was seed? Of course they were. This is just an attempt to belittle the Old Testament prophecies for the purpose of attacking the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ because the, the publishers uh, and the translators of the NIV have no need for a Jesus who is also God himself. Now, let me show you one more verse of scripture. Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. King James says, And knew her not, this is in reference to Mary and Joseph, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he, who's he? Joseph called his name Jesus. All right? The NIV says, uh, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. Not the firstborn son, but a son. And he, Joseph, gave him the name of Jesus. The people who produced the NIV also doubted the virgin birth of Jesus. Okay? Which is why they say a son instead of saying her firstborn son. Alright? Now, take a look. <clears throat> it says, And he, meaning Joseph, called his name Jesus in the King James. The NIV says, And he, Joseph, gave him the name Jesus. Joseph, he himself, did not give Jesus the name Jesus. 
okay? If you remember, Mary went off, she come back, she was pregnant. Joseph's like, oh my goodness, you know, she's cheated on me, now she's pregnant. You know, but I still love her. I'm not going to try to embarrass her. I'll just put her away privately. An angel came unto Joseph and said, Think not to take me as thy wife. Dude, she hasn't cheated on you. Don't listen to these folks. She's been faithful to you. What she's carrying is the Savior of the world, the Messiah, God's only begotten Son. So when the angel was speaking to him, he told him, he said, When this child is born, he says, that he will be called, or you shall name him the name Jesus. So Joseph, he himself didn't give him the name Jesus. He didn't go through a book of baby names and say, Oh, Jesus, that's a good name. We'll call him Jesus. No, Joseph himself didn't give him that name. The angel gave him that name. The angel commanded him to name or to call him that name. Okay? See? Change the words, change the meaning, change the intent, change the scripture. Words are important here, folks. All right? From the NIV, from their perceived translation of this, you would not even know if Jesus was the firstborn. In this day and age, the NIV has become uh, widely popular and used by many people. Uh, but the attacks on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ are creeping into most other versions and have been since the 20th century. The amazing thing is that so many have jumped on the bandwagon of the NIV to discredit the King James Bible and discrediting the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Lord foresaw this. Remember? You can't hide nothing from God. He sees all, hears all, knows all, right? So he foresaw this. And so... Since he foresaw this, he said in John chapter 8, verse 24, King James, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he. So, if you say that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, then ye shall die in your sins, according to the King James. All right, now, this is literally what the Greek Texas Receptus says. But, according to the NIV, this verse reads, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe, if you do not believe what? That I am. That I am what? That I am the one I am claim to be. Not I am, but the one that I claim to be. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, then you will die in your sins. Jesus is telling the Jews that he is God. The great I am, the only one who can save them from their sins, yet the NIV goes so far as to make it only a claim when they say, the one I claim to be. You can see what adding a few words can do to rob scriptures of their power and to rob Christ of his deity. Okay, folks, y'all got to be seeing this, all right? In John chapter 4, verse 50, Jesus heals the sixth son of a nobleman. Okay, Jesus is in Canaan of Galilee and the son, the sixth son, is in Capernaum. Two totally, completely different places, right? All right, listen. When we read verse 50 of John chapter 4, King James says, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and he went his way. Okay, folks, that's as simple as you can get. There is no need for any explanation here. So how, how in the world could the translators of the NIV mess this verse up? I'll show you. Listen. John chapter 4, verse 50, NIV says, Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Number one, do you not see how choppy this is? Do you not see how many words have been taken out? Number two, uh, in the NIV, it says, You may go. 
In other words, you may go, you may stay. You may sit, you may stand. Uh, do whatever you want to do. It's your choice. Do whatever you choose. All right? That King James says, Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. This was not put out there as a request. It was not put out there as an option. This was a commandment. He did not ask him or uh, give him a choice of whether he may go or stay. He gave him a commandment and he said, Go thy way. Go. Get out of here. Leave. Go. That is a commandment. All right? Now, the uh, King James says, Thy son liveth. This is the present. At that very second, that very moment. The NIV says, Your son will live. Future tense. Will live. All right? When Jesus said, Your son liveth, he said it in the present. Right at that moment, the son was alive. And the man, the father of the sick son, believed that his son was alive at that moment. To put into Jesus' mouth, your son will live, changes the meaning entirely. For this means that this man had no choice. He had no option. He had to go. He must go. Why? To see if, if, if what Jesus had said was true. All right? It says in King James, and the man believed. Means there's no doubt in my heart of mine. If you say he's alive, then I believe it. He's alive. I believe you, Lord. And he believed the word of, that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. In the NIV, it says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. Took. That word took. In other words, well, you know, I know who you claim to be, and I know what people say you can do, but, you know, I just, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not really buying it 100%. I mean, no offense, but, eh. Okay, okay, I tell you what. You know what? You say he's alive, we will just go with it, Okay. Sorry about that. Telephone. Um, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6, and I want to read uh, the first part of verse 2. It says, in King James, of the doctrine of baptisms. Okay? Baptisms. Plural, with an S on the end. For those of you who still have a problem believing there's more than one baptism, here you go. Baptisms. Plural. More than one. There is two baptisms, all right? But it says, of the doctrine of baptisms. NIV says, instruction about cleansing rites. Okay, number one, this is like starting in the middle of a sentence. Number two, it says cleansing rites. Cleansing rites are uh, what people would partake of if they had a uh, bodily or fleshly issue. You know, remember Naaman, he went down to the uh, river and dipped seven times to be made clean. If a woman had an issue of blood, she would go and she would take part in the cleansing rites and cleanse herself. If any man, you know, couldn't be patient and wait and he touched her before she became clean, then he was made unclean too. If you touched anything unclean, then you had to partake of the cleansing rites to be made clean. If you went to somebody's house and... Uh, whether it be a neighbor or, or, or a friend, when you walked in, you cleaned uh, and washed your hands and your feet. That's part of the cleansing rites. Remember, they uh, came from the church, the Pharisees, to Jesus, and they came against the disciples, saying, you know, they have totally ignored and disregarded the cleansing rites. They uh, have eaten with unclean hands. Those are cleansing rites. It has nothing to do with baptisms. We know what baptism is, okay? Two totally, completely Entirely different things here. All right? Look with me at verse 5. Verse 5, King James says, And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. This is in reference to the spiritual in King James. The NIV, it speaks to the natural. For it says, 
who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. Like I said, King James is spiritual. The NIV is worldly or natural, okay? In King James, when it says here at the end, um, and the powers of the world to come, we're here, we're alive in this world now, right? But there is a world to come in heaven with Jesus, all right? That's the world to come. And it's through the power of God in all heaven. All right? Now, in the NIV, when it says, and the powers of the coming age, see, the King James, when it says, the powers of the world to come, it's talking about a place. And in NIV, when it says, and the powers of the coming age, it's referring to uh, a point in time. All right? And the powers of the coming age, this is referring to the tribulation. All right? And it's also referring to the uh, Antichrist. Okay? How, how do you say that? How do you know this? Well, and the powers, the powers of the coming age, this world has no power, but they're perceiving the power of the Antichrist during the tribulation. They're exalting, lifting up the Antichrist here. That his power, there's nothing above him or greater than him or his power. Okay? They're exalting the Antichrist, and they're referring to the tribulation as to where King James is referring to the place of heaven and the world to come. In heaven with Jesus. All right? Two completely, entirely, totally different things. All right? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, and I want to read verses 16 to 17. We're about to catch them in, into a contradiction and a lie. Okay? Listen. King James, verse 16 says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The NIV says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. There's a big difference between command and shout. Shout is a noise. Command is something you're told to do. Completely, totally different here. All right? With the voice of the archangel and with the trump call of God. Okay? When they say the uh, trump call of God, there's something here that's misleading that's not right. I just hadn't figured that part out yet. But the King James and the NIV both end this scripture the same way. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay? Why do I point this out? L listen to me. Go to verse 17. King James says, then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right? Now, NIV says, after that, after what? The loud command. We, who are still, still alive, and are left, left what? Here on this earth, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Okay? And NIV, according to them, if we die before the Lord comes back, then we have no hope or no chance of ever going to heaven. Because it says, we who are still alive and left here on this earth will be called up. Alright? So, if we're already dead and gone, then we missed out. We have no hope, no chance of going to heaven. But you go back up to the previous verse, verse 16, and it says at the end, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Which is it? Pick one, choose one. They they so sinful and evil, they can't even keep their lives, their, their lives straight. Okay? One says the dead in Christ will rise. The other one says they won't. It is only we who are still alive and are left that will be called up. And the King James, when it says, then we which are alive and remain, okay, we who are alive in Christ, who are alive and remain alive, remain in Christ. Those, remember the scripture says, the race is not given to the swift, but to those who do to the end. Those who have given their life unto the Lord. They're alive within the Lord. They remain within the Lord until whether they 
die and leave this world, or the Lord comes back to what we refer to as the rapture of the church, uh, those who are alive in Christ and remain in Christ, those shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But according to NIV, one verse says the dead in Christ shall rise, and the other one says they won't. We who are still alive and are left will be called up. Which is it? See, confusion. God is not the author of confusion. What do we say? If he's not the author of it, then who is? Satan. This is the book of the devil. All right, now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to read verses 14 and 15. King James says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. All right? The NIV says, The person without the Spirit does not accept or receive uh, the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them. Doesn't know uh, whether it's right or wrong or not, uh, true or false, but they consider it. The King James says, for they are foolishness. NIV says, but they consider them foolishness. And the NIV goes on and says that they cannot understand them. Why? Same thing that the King James said. It says, in, in, in NIV's very own words, folks, not mine, uh, it says, because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Only through the Spirit. Okay? Look at verse 15, King James. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judging no man. Okay? Uh, verse 15 of NIV says, the person, the person with the Spirit, not the Spirit, but the person, the individual with the Spirit, the person makes judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. When it says, but he that is spiritual judges all things. He that is spiritual. He that has the Spirit of God in him. The Spirit judges all things. Okay? Yet he himself, the Spirit, is judged of no man. That's what that verse means. But here it says that the person, not the spirit, the spirit has no control, no authority, no power here. He has nothing to do with anything. It is the person themselves. They make judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. They're kind of, sort of, leaning to, there may be something more to this, but they're not even signifying that there is an actual judgment or that Christ will be the one who sits on the throne and does the judging. All right? Now, look with me at Ezekiel 28. And I want to look at uh, verse 19. It says, King James, All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. The NIV says, All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. Okay? Who knew you. Past tense. The King James says, And all they that know thee. Past, present, and future. Alright? Are appalled at you. You have come. Have come. Past tense. Have come. This has already happened. It's done and over with. It's, this is the past. You have come come to a harbor end and will be no more. Okay? Now, did I miss something? Because according to the NIV, you have come to a harbor end and will be no more. In other words, it's all over with. God's come back. The devil's already been cast into the lake of fire. God came back. Everybody went to heaven, but God forgot about us. He left us. Somebody needs to call him and tell him to come back and get us. You have, past tense, have come to a harbor end. But then it automatically switches and 
goes to the future tense and says, will be no more. Which is it? Has it already happened? Are you saying that it will happen? Or that he has come to the harbor end and in the future will be no more? I mean, this is all confusing. They don't know if they're living in the past, present, or future. They're part of the twilight zone, folks. Listen, listen. This is nonsense. Look with me at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. King James says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I know I ain't got to say it, but I'm going to anyway. We all know this is part of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Right? All right. NIV says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. All right? Listen. In King James, when it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's referring to that word we all hate, that GD word, okay? That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. And in NIV, when it says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. This is referring to something like, say you see something on TV, or you hear something that just sounds so unbelievable to you. I mean, you just, you can't fathom it, and you're like, oh my God! That's misuse. If, if you're using the name of God or Jesus, it better be in a, in a prayer or in a form of praise and worship. Neither one of these are good, but there is a huge, huge, huge difference between taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain with that awful word we don't like, as opposed to misusing the name of the Lord and saying that OMG. All right? Big difference here, folks. All right? And it says, Thy God, the name of thy God in vain. All right? Thy shows ownership. My God, your God, our God. If we say we believe in the one true God of heaven, this is our God. Okay? But in the NIV, it says, uh, Shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God. Whatever God you serve, your God. Not that there is one God, but multiple gods. Just like we saw before in Daniel. It used the plural form of God as gods, and it changed the capital G to a little g. All right? Meaning the God of this world, the prince of this world, as John calls him. The devil. All right? Now, Leviticus 18.6 says, King James Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. In other words, do not think, do not look at, do not desire, do not even attempt to try to uh, lay with your husband's wife. Uh, I mean, your brother's wife. I'm sorry. You ain't supposed to uh, have a desire to. You're not supposed to look at her in that way. And you're not supposed to try to have sex with your brother's wife. According to the NIV, it says, Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. In other words, what the NIV is saying here, he's like, listen, come on now. You know this is wrong. Don't have sex with your brother's wife. You know if he finds out, it's going to hurt his feelings. You can look, but you just can't touch. Are you kidding me? You can desire, you can lust after her, just don't touch. This is blasphemy, folks. Blasphemy. Listen, listen. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking here. And he says, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Okay? The NIV says, he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth, the fourth what? The fourth looks like. The fourth looks like what? The fourth looks like a son of the gods. Plural. 
And like I just said a moment ago, anytime you see the name of God in the Bible, it's always capital G. It shows deity, okay? But here, it takes it and it puts it as a little g. The little g-o-d is the little g-o-d of this world, Satan. And it says God's plural, more than one. Looks like a son of the gods, okay? So this is referring to multiple gods. They don't believe that God the Father is the one true living God. You've got to be seeing this. You've got to be seeing this, all right? Matthew 9, verse 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right? The NIV says, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay? Now, according to the NIV, it says, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay? To call the sinners for what? You gonna come call them a bunch of names? What are you calling us for? According to NIV, you'd never know. But the King James tells us, it says, to repentance. They took out repentance. They don't want you to know that there is forgiveness of sins. All right? Now, also, it says, I, I, meaning the Lord, I will have mercy, meaning I will have mercy on you. I will show compassion on you. I will pour out my love to you. I will put forth uh, the manner of forgiveness for your sins. It's something that comes from God, that we get from God, that we need, we have to have, that we desire. We get it from Him, right? Now, According to NIV, it says, I, I, meaning the Lord, I desire mercy. God desires mercy? From who? Us? Ha! Nonsense, folks. How do they ever think they get away with something like this? That's just too obvious. All right? Now, look with me at Matthew chapter 20, verse 22. King James says, But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. The NIV says, You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Okay, number one, King James says, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? NIV says, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? You can't drink a cup, you drink what's within the cup. When it says, are you able in King James to drink the cup of the cup that I drink? It's saying, can you uh, step and walk in my footsteps? Can you endure the cross, despise the shame, take the mockings, take the beatings, uh, remember in the cup at the, at the last supper he said he broke the bread said this is my body he held up the cup said this is my blood okay communion you know can you walk the wall and talk the talk can you live the same life that I have lived can you become the same thing that I have become it says we are able meaning you know we can move towards it uh, we can aspire to it uh, we'll do our best, but according to NIV, it says we can. Folks, this is of the devil. Matthew twenty-seven thirty-five. King James says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures did they, excuse me, Upon my vestures did they cast lots. Move us back. Sorry about that. All right. Now, the NIV says, When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. 
They took out the fulfillment of the prophecy here. Why? Because if they uh, try to put this verse into the NIV, then it connects Christ with the prophecy, which means that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're trying to do everything they can to refute that, to take it out, so that you don't know and have no way of showing, proving, or believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay? And uh, it's the actual prophecy itself. Also they took out. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. That wasn't my. My shows ownership. My garments, my vesture, which means they belong to Christ, the Son of God. Once again, they don't want you to be connected with information that goes to show you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All right? Mark 10, 21, King James says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. The NIV says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. They completely, totally, 100%, knowingly, willfully took out the cross. They take out the cross. They take out the baptism. They take out all this other stuff. Folks, they're trying to erase Jesus completely out of the Bible. My gosh. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. King James says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, That man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word of God. The NIV says, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. There's a difference between by and on. I'm not going to get into that. The thing I want you to notice is that the NIV says man shall not live on or by bread alone. So they're saying that we've got to have this bread. Remember, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All right? Man shall not live on bread alone. So even if we have this bread, then that's not it. I mean, we got to have more. There's something else, something more that we need. But according to NIV, you don't know what that is. But the King James tells us, and it says... By every word, word, singular, of God. Remember I told you, God didn't mean for His word to be spread out the way it is? One Father, one Son, one Spirit, one truth, one word, one Bible. By every word of God. All right? They don't want you to know that there's only one true word of God. That way you go out here and buy NIV, NASB, ESV, all these other translations to be led astray. They want you to think that it's all the Word of God. It's not. This is clearly, as I have done, showed you. Surely you can see it. This is the work of the devil. All right? Now, Luke 4, chapter 8, King James says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The NIV says, Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. All right? Number one, they completely and totally took out the part about, Get thee behind me, Satan. Number one, they didn't want you to know he was talking to Satan. Number two, they took it out, because when the Lord is having this conversation with Satan, when Satan come into the desert to tempt him after the 40 days, he didn't say, can you go? Will you go? Will you just leave me alone? You know, he didn't give him an option. He didn't ask him politely to leave. No. Get thee behind me, Satan. He was exhibiting and exhorting his power and his authority over Satan. They don't want you to see that anyone or anything has any power or authority over the devil. Then it says, 
For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Okay? They took out, Thou shalt. Thou shalt. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt. That is a commandment. Thou shalt. We must. We have to worship the Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. Okay? That word thy. It shows ownership. Your God. My God. The one true God of heaven. Our God. The NIV says, Worship the Lord your God. In other words, it doesn't matter which God you serve. Pick one. Choose one. Make one up. It doesn't matter. But whatever God you so choose, serve him only. So, once again, they're saying that God is not the one true God. Because, as we saw in Daniel, there's, according to them, there's more than one God. And it says, worship the Lord your God. You know, your God is your God. My God is my God. His God is his God. Her God is her God. You know, we all got different gods, but we all believe the same thing. Bull crap. Bull crap. That's nonsense. That's stupidity. Listen, folks, it takes an idiot to write this, and it takes an idiot to read it. So guess what I am right now, an idiot. But I don't count myself as an idiot because I'm trying to explain this to y'all. So there's a reason and a purpose behind it. All right, now, listen to this. Luke 9, verses 54 through 56, King James says, starting in verse 54, And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? All right, verse 54 of NIV says, When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? They completely and totally took out even as Elias did. All right? Well, you like I saw that, but I mean, what does that really have to do with anything? It has everything to do with it. Listen, listen, listen. Elias was a prophet, but you know, foremost, foremost, he was a man. You know, he was human like you and I, right? If you saw him on the street, you'd say, there's a man. You wouldn't intuitively think there's something special about him, right? Well, that's what it is here. It's, it's what was special about him. That's why they took it out. That's what they didn't want you to see. Because uh, he called down fire from above. And God consumed the altar, remember? With with the ones who worship uh, Baal, remember? The, they don't want you to realize and understand that the same power that is in God and Christ Jesus resides in you. And that the power of God in the name of Jesus that you have, I have, that lives within us, that we can stand with this power and in the name of Jesus and stand strong against the devil and fight him. They want you to be uh, the type of person that considers yourself to be weak and frail and incapable of doing anything. But through the power of God, you can stand up to the devil and say, in the name of Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. They don't want you to know that you have that same power within you. Come on. Folks, how do people read this stuff? Verse 55 King James says, But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. NIV says, But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Okay? Well, according to NIV, Jesus turned and rebuked them. Whoa! Hold on! Hold up! What's going on here? Why is he so mad? Why is he getting so upset? What's going on? You don't know! Because NIV doesn't tell you. They took out that ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. There's a spirit of God and spirit of the world and the devil. They don't want you to know there's more than one spirit. They want you to have the one spirit they want you to have, which is the spirit of the world and of the devil. All right? Now, listen. Listen. To truly understand it, verse 55 and 56 go together. Listen, listen, listen. King James. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. 
NIV says, But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Okay? They completely and totally took out, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The Son of Man. This is the Lord proclaiming, confirming who he is, his deity, his place, his position, his power, his authority, right here. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy man's life. This is proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They don't want you to know that. Once again, they took it out. Look with me at John chapter 6, verse 69. And the... Uh, uh, Verse reads from King James, and we believe and are sure, no doubt in our hearts, we 100% confident, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Another confirmation. But the NIV says we have come, come to believe and to know that you are, you are what? The Holy One of God. Well, you know, I know who you claim to be. Uh, I've heard about the miracles and I've heard some of the teachings you put out there. Uh, I think you got some good morals and good values. Uh, you seem like a, a stand-up guy. I believe you have a God-like quality about you. I don't believe you are the Son of God. Uh, but you have a uh, characteristic, a nature of God. So they call him the Holy One of God. Uh, Acts 2 verse 30, King James says, Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. This shows his place as the Son and His position in heaven. All right? NIV says, but He was a prophet. King James says, therefore being a prophet. One is present, one currently, right now. NIV, He was a prophet, past tense. But He was a prophet and knew that God had promised Him on oath that He would place one of His descendants on the throne. All right? King James Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him, who? To the Lord, Jesus Christ, that are the fruits of his loins, whose loins? God's loins, according to the flesh, which God in flesh, Jesus Christ, he would raise up Christ, the Son of God, to sit on his throne. The NIV says he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Uh, I'm sorry, but... Uh, doesn't the Bible say that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son? I didn't know the Lord had more kids. Did you? Me either. And I know they ain't trying to take this verse and, and apply it to one of us. God forbid, I promise you, that'll never happen. The reason they took out that he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne is because they knew who Jesus was. They seen his miracles. They heard his teachings. They saw him hung on the cross, nailed to a cross. They saw him uh, taken and buried in a tomb. For them to put uh, that Christ to sit on the throne, they would have to believe that the word of God was true. Because how, if, if, if Christ was nailed to a cross and died and laid in a tomb, how is it that Christ would be raised up to sit on his throne? So the saying that the only way this can happen is if the word of God is true and Christ, through the power of God, raised him from the dead. So they left that out because they don't believe in the resurrection. Remember when he uh, rose Lazarus from the dead? He told Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. They don't believe in the resurrection. To say that he would raise Christ to sit on his throne was mean that they believe in the resurrection and that they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See what lengths they're going to to try to take Jesus completely out of the Bible, out of Scripture? This isn't a Bible, folks. This is a work of the devil. Acts 3.18 
King James, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Folks, they take, and they do a number on this. They take the, the end and put it at the beginning, the beginning, in the middle, in the middle at the end. It's the one you can make heads or tails of it. Listen, NIV says, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Okay? King James says that Christ, the Son of God, Christ should suffer. He has so fulfilled. Okay? NIV acknowledges by saying, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold. So this really did, in fact, happen. They, they say, I believe this. Okay? But they won't say that Christ should suffer because that puts Christ right there as being the Son of God. But they say that his, his Messiah would suffer. Whose Messiah? God's Messiah? God's got a Messiah? No, God sent the Messiah. Are you kidding me? Folks, folks. How, how, if you read your Bible, if you have an NIV, how, how can you not see this? And I got to quit calling that thing a Bible. It's not a Bible. All right? Colossians 1.14. King James says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. NIV says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. They completely, totally, 100% took out the blood. They say that uh, we have redemption, and they agree uh, that there is forgiveness of sins, but they don't tell us how we get it. How do we get it? The King James tells us, through the blood, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Through Jesus Christ, through his blood, it's the only way. They took out the blood. Oh my gosh. The blood, the cross, the resurrection, the baptism. Folks, are you sure you want to call this a Bible? I could have just read this one verse right here that I'm fixing to read and it could have been enough to where I could just stop the video right there. This is all you need right here to, to know for a fact that the NIV is not a Bible. It is a work of the devil and that it is sending people to hell. All right, listen. First John chapter 4 verse 3. King James says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. So if you say you don't believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God, that he came, died, crucified, rose again, if you say that you don't believe that, then it says you are not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. All right? Now, NIV says, listen very closely here. I'm going to read it slow. NIV says, same verse of Scripture, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So they're saying that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, if you're born again, they're saying if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you have the spirit of the Antichrist. Are you kidding me? This is blasphemy against God, Jesus, and heaven. This is not the unforgivable sin, folks. This is all you need. My gosh, my gosh. Listen, 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 listen. Final thoughts, final thoughts. I want to read two more scriptures to you real quickly. All right? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 says, King James, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Okay? Psalms 
32, 9, King James. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Okay, now, what does that mean? All right. Reggie translation, what they're saying here is this. Don't be a fool. Okay, you have just seen what I have shown you here. Folks, if you have an NIV, NIV, you have everything that you need, every reason in the world to take and throw that thing in the trash. You need to go buy you a King James. And if you have a pastor that stands in that pulpit and teaches and preaches out of the NIV, your pastor is a devil. He is a worker of the devil. And if you're sitting in that church, listening to that preacher preach, then you are the children of the devil. It's that simple, folks. You have seen here. I have shown you. Shown you. Proved to you through Scripture. This is not a Bible. This is not the Word of God here. You cannot say that you know your Bible, you read your Bible, or you know God. This is not a Bible. It has everything the exact opposite of what the Bible says. It's all a bunch of lies. And you can't say that you know God because they've done everything they can to go against God and take Jesus completely out. The cross, the baptism, uh, salvation, forgiveness of sins. Folks, there's no way you cannot see this. Listen, have you ever heard that saying, you are what you eat? Well, according to uh, a biblical or a religious uh, perspective, uh, and especially when it comes to the Bible, uh, you are what you read. So how well do you know what you read? All right? Now, when the NIV first came out, it was published and printed by a company called Zandervan. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that name. You've heard of it, okay? Well, I don't know what happened, but something happened, and they sold it, or at least sold the publishing rights uh, of the NIV to another company called HarperCollins. Never heard of them? Me either, okay? Well, who's HarperCollins? Well, I'll tell you who they are. HarperCollins is the ones that uh, now print and publish the NIV. So if you buy one today, that's what it will say, published by HarperCollins, all right? Now, HarperCollins are, is the same ones that print and publish the Satanic Bible. HarperCollins is also the ones that print and publish a book titled The Joy of Gay Sex. <laughs> Folks, what more do you need? Folks, listen, listen, listen. You sit in the church and being taught and preached through the NIV, you sit at home and read an NIV, listen, you serve your God, I'll serve the one true living God. And when we get to heaven, we'll see how it all pans out. Okay? Because I'm telling you what, I'm not backing off from the one true living God, the creator of all things, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the one who will be my judge, your judge. That's who I serve. You serve who you want to. You say, I love my Bible. I love my NIV. I, I, I wouldn't know what to do without it. I like it immensely. Well, you can like and love your Bible all you want to. But I tell you what, you can like and love that NIV all the way up to the gates of hell, but when you die, make sure you pack a bathing suit because I'm telling you, I hear it's hot down there. Folks, that Bible will not lead you into a right relationship with God because it's not a Bible. It is a satanic book. Jeez. Folks, I know y'all think I'm getting too upset. I know that y'all think that I am uh, getting too emotional here. Folks, I don't mean to, but it really gets to me when I sit here and I read this nonsense. And that, to know that people actually accept this and believe this as the true word of God. How ignorant can people be? I don't care if you've never in your life read any other translation or any other book other than the NIV. There's no way you can sit down and read this book and believe this is the true word of God. Use what God put between your ears now. 
Make use of it. It's cut, folks. Listen, this is why I say I'm cutting back on my videos. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to get this emotional upset uh, with all of these teachings that I have. I'm sitting here and I am fighting tooth and nail with everything that I have, every fiber of my being. I am fighting for your soul. But why should I fight for it when you won't fight for it yourself? The value of any object or anything is based upon the amount someone's willing to pay for it. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Jesus Christ said that your soul is the most valuable thing you have. So valuable that he gave his life for it. But you can't fight for it. You got some stranger like me that's trying to fight for it. At the very least, you should be willing to stand behind me while I fight for your soul. But I think it's pitiful that a total stranger has to fight for your soul because you're too lazy to. You listen to that pastor. That pastor will lead you to hell and that book will lead you to hell. That is not a Bible. And if you got a pastor that teaches and preaches at NIV, you need to go buy him a King James. And you take it and you give it to him. And when you do, he's going to say, Oh, how wonderful. I just... Wait. This is King James. And you're going to be like, Well, yeah, duh. I know. I know one who bought it. He's going to be like, but you know I teach and I preach at the NIV. Why would you get me a King James? And you look right back at him and say, well, Pastor, it's because I love you and I don't want to see you die and go to hell. And for once in your life, I'd like for you to open up this book right here and teach us the truth of God's word so we can get off the milk and get on the meat. Folks, I am sick and tired of going to war for everybody else. There are times I need to get a war for myself. I'm more concerned about your soul than I am mine. I'm closer to going to hell than any of you, but I'm still concerned more with your soul than you are. Do you not see a problem with that? People been watching my videos for a year and still can't decide whether or not they can trust me. No. People are going to have to start doing things on their own. I mean, I, 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 I've had it. I've had it. I've had it. I, mean, I love you. And I am trying my very best to help you. I do nothing but share the truth of God's word with you. And if you can't uh, form enough of, opinion, of an opinion to decide whether or not you should trust me by now, I can't help you. I can't help you. I can pray for you, but I can't help you. There's nothing more I can do for you. I have proven to you time and time again, over and over and over and over, God's word backs up everything I say. Today, we just compared the King James with NIV. You see how different they are. They are completely and totally opposite of one another. One tells you all about Jesus and how wonderful he is and, and all the things that, that he accomplished and he did and how much he loves you. And uh, the other one says that God's not... Uh, uh, the one true God. There are other gods and Jesus Christ is not his son. And uh, there is no such thing as baptism, salvation, repentance, uh, the cross, any of that stuff. They take it all out. I mean, come on, folks. I've got another long video called Who is Jesus? Uh, I've almost decided against doing it because um, I really don't think a lot of you would understand it. I don't think it would really sink in that you'd be able to get it. Um, maybe somewhere down the line I might do it, but right now I'm going to hold off on it. A um, friend called and talked to me about uh, the concept of the spirit of truth and uh, the comforter. Uh, he had some questions about it, and um, I may look a little more into that, and I may do a video on that. I'm not sure. It won't be many scriptures, and it won't be over... 30, 35 minutes. Folks, I love you. And I only want what's best for you. I want you to succeed. I want you to have a close, personal, intimate relationship with God. I want Him to invade every part, every aspect of your life. I want you to learn how to fall in love with Jesus all over again. But I told you, whether you believe it or not, just because you don't believe it, 
doesn't make it untrue. I can I can I can sense your spirit. Um I don't understand why some people still remain the same way they were the first day they came to this channel. I don't understand why there hasn't been a change. I don't understand uh, what it is about my videos that people don't get to understand. There's so much information, I overwhelm you with it. I make it crystal clear. I don't know what more to do. But I'm going to start doing Jesus and I'm going to start doing me again. And I'm going to do things my way and the Lord's way. And if the scripture that I share and the length of the videos I share are not long enough, you need more, well, you can buy you a King James and you can open it up and find it for yourself. Because I'm tired, folks. I'm tired. And I just, I, 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 I can't do this anymore. Not when, when you won't even uh, value your own soul enough to fight for it yourself. The Bible says that uh, if you go to someone's house and uh, they receive you and they're kind to you and they bless you, when you leave, you bless them. It says, but if you go into the house and they reject you, they shut you out, kick you out, uh, then when you leave, you dust uh, the sand or the dirt off your shoes. A lot of people use that verse. You know, I tried talking to them, you know, but they just won't listen, so I'm just going to dust uh, the dirt off my shoes. I know that's what the Bible says, but folks, each person has a soul, and it's that soul that God so desires. The heart of the individual that God wants As long as you're walking, talking, living, and breathing in this world, you have this soul within you. It's hard for me to give up on you. I'm not giving up on you. I'm just taking a step back. When, when, when people truly are hungry and desperate and desire to grow in their relationship with God, in the knowledge of God in the Bible, when they uh, uh, hunger and thirst uh, for more of Him, then... Y'all let me know. Then I may go back to posting some of these long videos. But until then, no. They're going to be short. 30, 35 minutes tops. Uh, somewhere between four to six verses. I love you. I'm going to pray for you. If you still don't believe the NIV is the book of the devil, then God, I hope he has mercy on your soul. I can't, I can't prove it any more than I already have. Folks, y'all have a wonderful week. I love you. Girls, I love you. Until next time, YouTube, may God be with you.